Um, all right, we are uh, we're live. We got a special guest in the house. Um, there is you know, there's a uh, multiple episodes coming out. You've seen the branding. Uh, you know, you guys got your own social media branding. Uh, this is the duel coming up. Um, there's multiple locations, and um, you know, there's there's been a lot of talk about this specific um, this this video series, these docu series, and um, you know the word's kind of getting out that it's actually going to be happening. So um, Gibbons, the guy behind it, um, you know we appreciate you coming in the show and and talking with us a little bit about it. But I mean I know this has been a long process for you guys, so I think you know talking with Adam, we really kind of wanted just to to talk with you just about you know. This wasn't easy to get done, and, uh, you know, the excitement is building, and it's, it's finally here that people are going to start seeing, you know, a little bit more history of the specific duel and just the, the history of our sport, right? I think that's important. So thanks for coming on the show. Hey, thank you, Tony. So um, well, I guess what I can add to what you're saying here is that I, that we, we did a, a six-part docuseries on the 86 duel between Iowa and Iowa State, and um, uh, it, we look at this as kind of a time capsule, interviewed uh, uh, 17 of the 20 guys that were in this thing and the significance of this duel is that uh, we had uh, 12 guys in this duel that won 16 national titles in their career. Uh, we had uh, you know 29 uh, NCAA finalist of, uh, performances between these these teams with the, the guys in their career. So uh, 44 All-Americans, 11 guys from the state of Iowa that, that won uh, 24 Iowa State titles. So it's very uh, Iowa-centric in that way. But, you know, Basically, taking a, a piece of, of, of worn out, uh, disintegrating public television footage, and and doing something that's really never been done in the sport before, a, a docu series like this, and a little bit like the the Last Dance, and and uh, in that that it, we go into a, a lot of different uh, storylines uh, after the. It's just not it's it's not what people think it is. Uh, uh, but my good friend John Myers uh, from California. Uh, He's not really from California. He's from Eagle Grove. He grew up in Eagle Grove, Iowa, which we know is one of the cradles of wrestling civilization in the state of Iowa. Um, uh, grew up there as a high school wrestler, wrestled for Nebraska during this time period. And during COVID, uh, he, he was out in, in, in L.A. where he's been for the last 30-plus uh, you know, uh, years. Uh, uh, during COVID, he ended up uh, going down some rabbit hole. He only needs about four hours of sleep. And uh, he called me up, and I was building my house in Johnston, Iowa, standing on the roof. I took, a call, took his call. We probably talked four or five uh, times a week. A great friend of mine, uh, one of those guys I bounce off all my, uh, my stuff I do on uh, wrestling media and all that stuff. And, and, and I think uh, we've become very close friends over the years. We met uh, through my uh, old college roommate, Kelly Ward, who was a national champion at Iowa State. Kelly coached him uh, at Nebraska and, and was great friends after that. So... We uh, uh, had a lot of commonality, so we've been very close for the last 25 years. And he called me up and says, hey, I've been watching this duel between Iowa and Iowa State in 1986, and, and uh, uh, this is one of the most dramatic things I've, I've ever seen. And for me, uh, you know, for, for, and for our team and all that stuff, we won the duel, uh, but we had this, you know, we, we kind of went down a little bit after you know, going into the Nationals and didn't have a lot of things figured out as a staff and, and – uh, also, uh, just our, our performances had a couple number two seeds that didn't place in the tournament at all, and and didn't have our best effort. And so, in some ways, it was kind of a, a burning memory about really how we performed after that duel because we had uh, beat a couple of their national, cha eventual national champions in the meet, and and uh, won the duel. But looking back at it, uh, just thought that for a second there that this was one of the more significant teams for me personally. It was my first team that I coached. Uh, in, in 86, where I had total control of what was going on. And um, they meant so much to me personally as, as to, uh, you know, when you're 26 years old and you're head coach at Iowa State and <laughs> taking on a major program, you know, it's important that you get off to a great start. Well, we were 19-1 and one in duels uh, that year, finished fourth in the country. And even though we didn't have the national tournament that, that we had, the fact that we beat Iowa in a dual meet on public television in front of a statewide television audience kind of got people thinking that, you know, yeah, this was the right decision. And, and uh, you know, we followed it up the next year with the national title. But the uh, but a lot of that expectations were set from the, the work that we did. The, these guys totally bought into what we were trying to, to, to do there. You know, we brought in Ed Bannock as, a, as our assistant coach. We had great guys that were in our, pro, uh, our program, uh, Wayne Cole, Kevin Darkus, uh, you know, 
were just great people. And uh, we just ended up going out there and, and, and doing our best. And, and uh, But, you know, we had such high expectations. We told these guys at the beginning of the year that we are going to win in Iowa City. We're going to stop the streak, all right? The streak's going to stop at 8, all right? Well, it didn't quite turn out that way. Uh, but uh, but we decided at that moment, and, and you know, I, I knew how much work this, this might be. And so I told John, and, and uh, he was thinking, well, maybe we'll interview three, four guys. I go, we're, we're going we're gonna to do this. I, uh, we're going to talk to everybody, all right? So, and, I, you know, and he called my bluff. He goes, okay, we'll talk to everybody, all right? And he was so locked in on this project, and, and that's what we ended up doing. We ended up talking to, you know, the assistant coaches, Mark Johnson for Iowa and Ed Bannick. Uh, we brought in uh, 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 Chuck Patton, who was the color commentator for uh, Iowa Public Television. He and Doug Brown had great chemistry together. And uh, uh, it, there's just so many storylines on this, uh, this time capsule. And, uh, you know, and after we did all the interviews and, and all that, there were, th- were storylines developed. We didn't really know exactly where we were going to go with this. We obviously wanted to tell the story of the competition, but it ended up morphing into something uh, uh, quite a bit different. And there's, uh, after the last hand raise, there's probably about 11 different storylines that develop after this, and it's pretty cool to be part of. Yeah, I mean, when you guys, um, you, you talk just about how significant these team members were, you know, to you just personally and just to this day, right, is, is um, you know, did you go? Did you go to them? I mean, how how do you guys how do you guys go about interviewing every single person? Well, I mean, with your busy life, you know, there's lots of stuff going on. Well, th- there was, and I, I was building a house at the time, and it, 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 but we ended up uh, for the most part these were one call closes, and you know, I, I think that that probably has a lot to, hopefully, it has a lot to do with the trusting relationship I had with guys on both sides. You know, I, you know, through my my broadcasting career, I got to, to know obviously guys like Jim Heffernan. Brad Penrith and, you know, Dwayne Goldman, you know, these guys had uh, extensive college coaching careers and, and, uh, you know, but even guys like uh, uh, Matt Eglin, who I just tipped my cap to, to, to showing up and, and spending time with us on this. And nine of the guys that got beat, all right, interviewed with us and they were fantastic. And, and uh, I, uh, I was, you know, after going through the interview process, we did 4,000 minutes worth of interviews we interviewed Phil Henning, who was the referee uh, that night, and um, who was, an, by the way, in 1970, was a runner-up. You know, everybody talks about Gable getting beat. Well, Phil, Phil Henning got beat uh, as the NCAA runner-up that year in 1970 at McGall Hall in Northwestern. So he was wow. there. He got beat by Jason Smith uh, uh, from Iowa State. It was Iowa, Iowa State uh, back then. So he uh, uh, had a, a distinguished career at the University of Iowa, and uh, he was a referee, a great referee, did a lot of uh, – big meets here in, in uh, Iowa, Iowa State, UNI. So, um, yeah, we interviewed him. We interviewed the uh, uh, Sports Illustrated writer uh, who ended up being, it actually it was his first break uh, to get to write with Sports Illustrated, Ivan Mazel. Ivan Mazel has had his uh, career at Sports Illustrated. He ended up being on the College Football 150 uh, episode for, uh, um, you know, you've seen that big thing where they sit around the panel mm-hmm. and talk about uh, the history of uh, college football. Well, he's the uh, he's the guy with the Alabama uh, drawl accent, and uh, he's uh, had a great career uh, with uh, ESPN dot um, com and also with uh, Sports Illustrated. But his memories of the meet were pretty significant too. You know, we, we, uh, he was a young sports writer, twenty six year old. We were both the same age. You know, so I remember going out with him, and uh, you know, it, back then, you know didn't have the internet you didn't have all that that, that media presence yeah sports illustrated was it and this meet was featured on the larry bird cover right and larry bird oh. the larry bird cover is what the most uh, uh bought you know is the, the largest uh, uh episode that their ep- ep- edition or whatever what the word is there yeah. but uh that, that the sports illustrated has ever had and, and we're on the table of contents wow. our dual meet is and the picture that you see from our poster Right here is uh, uh, for, for with me is is right out of Sports Illustrated. So it had a lot of uh, coverage, but this was a young aspiring uh, uh, guy that wanted to go ahead and move on from being a fact checker to being a quality writer, and this was his first break. Yeah, wrestling is always just a like people that don't know wrestling, but they grew up in the journalist. You know, they grow up 
just like wanting to be a journalist, right? And they get, oh, hey, you're going to be on the wrestling beat. And it just, it takes a little bit of time just to like, to just kind of figure out how crazy people are in wrestling. And then you kind of get them suckered. And that's what I, I've seen anyways. As a wrestling person, it's easy for me. And I wasn't a journalist, but like, you know, I just. You, you talk about uh, making the calls. What was, who made the call, to, who made the call to Gable? And what was the pitch to Gable to get him involved? Uh, well, Dan and I spent a lot of time together with uh, doing broadcasts together. And I think really once he realized the significance and he, he came there with a, a, a lot to say and uh, uh, he was ready. We actually filmed him and my, uh, he and I sat down together and, and uh, uh, in my brother's uh, uh, barn, right? And if you've ever been to my brother's barn, you know, it's, it's, it, it looks like it's designed for animals, but it's really designed for a party. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, my brother, Joe, he was the host of it there. And so, you know, he and Kevin Dresser sat down together, the juxtaposition of Kevin now being the coach at Iowa State and, and Joe, the returning national champions, big match for him, but also Gable and I sat down together. So those were the first uh, interviews that we did. And uh, I think that the, we have Dan in, in a way that not a lot of people have seen him, particularly in the, in the beginning of, of this. Uh, people who've been coached by him will, will understand that that's him, uh, but uh, it, it's we have it, it's a unique uh, look at Coach Gable, and when you think about it, you know, obviously thirty people look up the history of this, but this is the nine in a row, right? And that was in jeopardy, right? After you know we beat him in, in, in the duel, and and, and uh, it, it, it ends up being about uh, going into the really kind of the magic uh, that that Gable had and. and both teams, both programs, you know, it's funny because we, we, it's the duel, you know, well, it's not a try meet, it's not a quad, right? It's the duel. The duel is two, the two programs, the two cultures, the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, they, they both feed off of each other and it's not a duel, right? The, the, well, it's a duel meet. Well, no, we're not, you know, we're not sabers or we're not pistols or whatever. We're not trying to kill each other, right? It's, it's, it's the two, right? Two, two teams are going out there. It's kind of the double entendre of, you know, that's why we call it the duel is that it's just the, it, it's the two. And you can see, you know, differences. And, and uh, like in the first episode, we go with, uh, spend a lot of time kind of developing, you know, where we all came from, how we all knew each other and that, and that, that type of thing. And, that, um, and you see a lot of that all the way through because a lot of these guys grew up together. We knew about each other. Kistler family in Riverside, California. Well, we saw those guys when I was seventh grade, uh, eighth grade uh, up in Missoula, Montana, right? Wrestled uh, Marty's uh, older brothers, right? And uh, uh, guys like Jeff Kerber and, and uh, going up there to, to, we used to travel the country. They're wrestling the best people in the world. And we, my, our dads got to know the Kistler's dads. You know, so there's a lot of commonality, all right, that was happening all the way through this. I remember as a college wrestler going to uh, Colorado Springs and being in a wrestling room and a young Dwayne Goldman came to work out with us at 138 pounds or whatever he was. And I was the 34 pounder and I was, you know, I, I rolled around with him a little bit, you know, uh, back then. So it, the, it's amazing all the threads that, that we couldn't even begin to uh, uh, talk about even after uh, this duel. Dwayne Goldman, was, his son was coached by Perry Summit, the R18 pounder, you know, who, who got, went back to Indiana and coached. So there's just a lot of threads uh, all the way through this. A lot of them we, don't even, we couldn't even get to all of them. But we had 4,000 minutes worth of interviews. We felt pretty strongly that, that, that uh, uh, the, the content needed to be, you know, longer. And, uh, and, and that, that's where we got to the six episodes. So it's really five episodes about... Uh, the wrestling and, and no, the sixth episode is about 36 minutes. It's my favorite because nobody gets beat. <laughs> I mean, it, it was it was so cool to go see these guys in their element, reconnect. You know, particularly with a, a, a lot of uh, guys that, that I'd coached and you know, spent a little time with their wives and all that. that that's uh, just the people that are around them. Uh, of course, both my brothers were in the meet and. So we, we just had, you know, we just knew all these guys. But even guys like, like I said, the guys that, uh, you know, like, like Mark Singlinger in this thing. You can't believe the amazing career that he had, right, 
as, as a uh, college athlete, he was the two-time Big Ten uh, uh, lineman of the year, and he uh, was also a two-time All-American. You know, and he's six weeks off of the Rose Bowl, starting in the Rose Bowl for Iowa, and he's thro- thrown into this dual meet. You know, it probably certainly wasn't his, his, his best performance and all that stuff, but he spent the time to talk to us, and I can't, can't thank the guys that showed up and got on camera enough, um, you know, and I'm sure it was, you know, in, in some ways it was somewhat cathartic for uh, a, a lot of them, particularly maybe Matt Eglin, who spent time talking with us. But Matt's in every episode. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, it was a rough time for him. And, um, but, uh, but I was, you know, I was just dominating the conversation here. But No, you're good. Yeah, I yeah. think where fellas was, you know, when you, you call Dan Gable to be a part of this, obviously it wasn't <laughs> the, the end story of, yeah. you know, we, we see Dan – and when he's portrayed, obviously in, in wrestling, everything is you know winning, and they, you know Owens gets brought up every once in a while. But I think it's intriguing that you say you know you're going to see Dan in a different light. So I think that question is like oh. you know probably not a thing that he's been comfortable or used to being talking about as the the bad parts I guess so of his career, right? From a viewer standpoint, um, I think there's some real nuggets in here. Is if you're a viewer, if you really listen and pay attention. Um, it's probably one of the most vulnerable times you'll see Coach Gable. Almost like a, it's like a cleansing period for him. Like he verbalized a lot of things that if you're a coach or you're leading young men in the sport or anything in life that you can really hone in on if you listen to what he's saying. Um, you know, basically, <clears throat> basically he come to the grips of that winning. Hit, you know, it, whatever was going on, they always end up winning anyway. So, you know, maybe the details are how he was going about it wasn't the right way to do it and it didn't matter because at that point they went on that year even though they lost the duel they still went on to win their ninth in a row right and you can see like the reflection period about his choices you know he talks about just overall how he needed to change his lifestyle as a human being to be a dad and a father so it's really intriguing from a from a a viewer standpoint or fan of sport especially someone that puts gable at such a high high level to see him open up and be that vulnerable for you as a viewer to see, you know what, even though he's viewed as invincible in mm-hmm. a lot of people's eyes, he still he still has the same feelings as everybody else. Yeah. He he's uh he still had weaknesses to overcome. It wasn't just easy. Talk about the Gable magic. Um it's pretty intriguing. I think he he, he was willing to go there and uh it, it, it didn't he he had I think a lot like you say, a lot maybe a lot on his heart at that point in time and and um it's kind of funny because Iowa fans that we've kind of screened this with get visibly uncomfortable when they watch Gable in the beginning of this thing. And, you know, and, and uh, Dad asked me one time, he says, well, what's this really about? I says, well, I says, you do a great job of knocking yourself off your own pedestal in the first episode and, and the rest of it. Uh, we, uh, your, your team, myself, so part of my team, puts you back on your pedestal where you belong. And uh, the... Uh, it, it's again, why why is this significant? Again, the, the talent that was out there, the credentialed guys that were out there, as far as NCAA credentials, I think is difficult to to uh, uh, to match. The fact that we have the footage that the uh, the meet and the wrestling was good, right? There's no, no question about it. these guys were going at it, and um, um, you know the uh, it just it just speaks to that era and. Why is Dan Gable always going to be significant is, I think, one of the reasons is because of nine in a row. And that we give you a very clear look at what was happening inside the program at that point in time. And, 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 and we don't have a narrator. We, don't ha- we, we didn't really actually know where this was going to go until we edited the footage. And there's some guys that pop out on this thing that, that end up, and Chuck Pat is great as far as helping us out, the, 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 our color commentator, who also had a wonderful career was a national champion coach at the college level with uh, with you and I, and and um, just a just a great guy, and uh, still alive, still still vibrant. Uh, we caught him on the golf course, and uh, I'm wandering here a little bit, but we caught these guys. This isn't you know folding chairs in front of wall mats, as I always say. Yeah. All right. This Typical is. Typical interview. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we went to Chuck Patton's uh, uh, golf course where he serves as a, as, as a ranger and basically, you know, golfs every day in Seattle, right? 
we filmed them in the rain because it rains in Seattle. Yeah. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, that the, uh, you know, Mike Van Arsdale in, in, in Arizona, uh, Dwayne Goldman, uh, with Pike's Peak in the background. Well, cause that's where he lives. He looks out their backyard and that is, uh, uh, dad's Hank's place. And there's, there's Pike's Peak in the background. Tim Krieger was, uh, uh at the shooting range at Colorado Springs where his daughter was, uh, you know, at the time Olympic hopeful, uh, trying to, uh, uh, make a make a world team here was you know in in, the, in skeet shooting and um, trap shooting so you know we went to where all these guys were my brother's barn uh, the, the uh, you know the, the you know my, my brother's office Greg Randall at the Memorial Union in Iowa City uh, uh, you, know, you know Matt Eglin with the Iowa River in the background and, the, and who can't everybody who's been to Iowa City knows where the the power plant is you know it's all painted that that uh, rustic uh, uh, brown primer color, you know? So I, uh, uh, it, was, it was fun going out and seeing these guys. It, it, was, uh, uh, it was a great trip. Uh, John and I, you know, just, we enjoyed each other's company, but it was just that battle to get all this footage in. And then the editing process begins and, you know, where, where, where do you, you want to go? But our whole thing was fun and cool, right? We want to be, that this is gonna, this gotta be fun and, it, and it's gotta be cool because I really believe that that you know wrestling is cool and it's fun. There's so many things that happen when you're on a team, you know, you know the things that you, you end up cutting up on each other or whatever. It, it just 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 being part of a being being part of a team. And I told you this earlier, Tony. I, I had a good friend of mine, Adam Darangowski, that uh, uh, coached with me for a year. He was from Ryder. He finished third place. I remember. I think Chad Zapital was in that weight class. It was Prescott may have been the national champion that year. But he ended up uh, being third in the country. And he told me after watching this, we had him screen it because we were looking for input from people who had been in Iowa but had been out of state and said, what do you think? Does this thing have a wider audience beyond the state of Iowa? And he goes, Jim, he says, uh, uh, I would gladly give up my third place medal all right, to have wrestled on one of these teams. <laughs> That's a great segue because my, my next question was going to be, Think about the state of Iowa, like the prestige. People talk about, you know, Iowa wrestling, the tradition of the state of Iowa. You know, majority of these guys that wrestle in the duel, the coaches in the duel, are still seen today as legends, icons of the sport. They're recognized. What, what history and uh, what drove, what importance did the public viewing of IPTV have for not just only wrestling, but, uh, continue building the, the base and foundation of wrestling in the state of Iowa? Well, I think we, we try to uh, make uh, public television ends up being a character in this story. Yes. We spent nine minutes in this, uh, uh, in the first episode, laying the foundation. So in the, in the first episode, you're always laying the foundation, you know, for the storylines that end up happening. And I've learned a lot about this. They go, what, what, what do you have? Uh, what was, what is being, I'll just come back to your point here, but what does an executive director do? All right. <laughs> well, you make all the make a lot of phone calls. You get people, you know. Hey, will you show up? Will you talk to us? We, love it. you know, there was a lot of, uh, and it turned into a more uh, exacerbating uh, role when we were trying to basically get the rights to this. But uh, the, the 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 thought, uh, we wanted to make sure that people knew how important public television was to wrestling, and they're a character in this story, with the the work that Doug Brown, who's been deceased, and now, and Chuck Patton, uh, it was great to have him on here. But we spend nine minutes in this thing paying homage to what, you know, we, 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 you're viewing the stations of Iowa Public Television, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the whole thing, the, the, what they did for our sport. And the reason why they can't do this in Oklahoma or they can't do it in Pennsylvania or whatever, uh, uh, tell these stories, because they don't have this footage. And that and that's what we, we had. And, and and, and that's why we're making an effort to see that, hey, this is what great storytelling can do with your footage. Let's, let's, let's go out there and tell a great story. But this is, we, this, we started right at the top at, with, with uh, the, the year that uh, Gable won the nine in a row and we beat him in a duel. So it was how, cool. Uh, a better way to put it, how, how important was the, the at that time, Iowa, Iowa State wrestled tw two times a year. Um, there was maybe like six to eight duels total, maybe on IPTV. Thirteen sometimes. Okay, thirteen. Yeah. How yeah. much? How much of the of that? Those those uh, live streams, even if they're uh, 
dated a little bit, you know, time released. How important was that to driving involvement for the state of Iowa for kids to aspire and overall tradition of the sport? I guess is what I'm trying to get to. Well, like, like if you didn't have these yeah. duels on at that time on public television, me being a five at the time watching the duel, right? Would would the state of Iowa still have a still level of importance of a wrestling, or do you think this drove a huge trajectory for the state where it is today? The following of wrestling. Well, think about this for a second, okay? Uh, Tom Brands was a junior in high school. I talked to him a couple days uh, earlier this week about this. Um, you know, he, he he grew up watching these things. The Brands boys, every other guy that wanted to become a, a state champion or na eventual national champion, Olympic champion, whatever your goals, they, they were tuned into this, okay? The... The, the, the footage would get out and, and go to other states and all that stuff. They got a chance to watch some of the best wrestling. And in this meet, you have, uh, what was it, uh, 17, 15 of the last 17 national championships were won by these two teams. Yes. And it ended up being 17 out of 19. Now, you, if you, if I've done a lot of thinking about this, but, you know, one of the, the most significant things that happened in the state of Iowa we, we don't really recognize was the Iowa State team in 1965 led by Tom Peckham from Cresco, Iowa, ends up, you know, they end up winning the national title and, and, and 15 years worth of dominance from the UNI win in 1950, right, to 1965. So we'll say that's 15-year period here that they, they stopped that Oklahoma string, right? Oklahoma and o Oklahoma State each won it one more time, right, after that. And then it was basically Iowa... Iowa State and Iowa up until really 1988 when Bobby Douglas's team, uh, and there was a four-year period there were two Oklahoma State titles, Arizona State, you know, the three, I guess, three-year period. But for that period, we, uh, the state of Iowa dominated college wrestling. Um, the new technology uh, then, the, 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 the seminal event was the coaching of Gable, right? Not only the, the effort and, and uh, uh, of, of being a, a teammate at Iowa State, and changing the help changing the culture there, but there was Tom Peckham there, and that foundation of that '65 team that wrestled things away. And in '66, Iowa State hosted the NCAA's, which I was a little kid then. I remember going to it as a little kid, not remembering much about what I saw, but at least laid eyes on it. And um, um, you know, all the way, you know, you, you take that all the way to uh, you know the, where the, at that that time. That's again set from 1970. And then from 1977 through 87, each, you know, that, that was 10 years in a row right there. It was either Iowa or Iowa State. So, yeah, I mean, and then you think about it, Iowa had, I don't know how many, oh, year after year, five Iowans on the team. Year when we won nationals, right? We had six Iowans uh, on the team. Um, and... You know, it wasn't just so much it was just Iowans. It was just that they came in to be part of these cultures, right, which were a little bit different in, in, in a lot of ways. By this time, Gable was a much more, you know, uh, you know, he's probably 36, 37 years old at the time, and he's, he's, uh, he's really got it going, you know, everything about that program. I mean, think about it, eight in a row, and they're going for nine, and, and – and they've got that team that they had there, and they ended up having five NCAA champions and a finalist with eight guys. And you look at the two guys who, 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 who uh, did, didn't win, right, or didn't win, Rico and Royce, they both end up being national champions uh, uh, later, Royce the next year, uh, Rico two years later, and um, uh, actually Rico the next year, right, because he wanted that both of them were the national champions the next year. You take a look at they set this the point spread differential between first and second was still the record seventy two points. It's amazing. I mean it, it's uh, uh, and, and, and this is you know there wasn't a lot of transferring going back then. Yeah. The guys that transferred were guys that, that had dropped programs. So a lot of this was you know d developed, you know recruited and developed, uh, and you, you just didn't move around the way you see it. Well, I, I heard. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question. Oh, you did. There, but, like I yeah. heard a recent interview. I mean, I think Tom said uh, maybe in that the Big Ten thing. You're, there's a couple of things you were late for, like church, yeah. something else, and IPTV. Like he was never late for. And then I heard Dwight Henson, who was on an interview on your on your platform recently, talk about when he was being recruited. Um, he was 
about dead set on going to Arizona State with Bobby Douglas. Bobby Douglas was going to Iowa State. And one of the biggest pulls for him coming to, to Iowa State was he had wrestling on TV. So, like, when you look at the – I think it's important in anything – uh, that you like or appreciate or you follow, like to really understand the history of it, things. And I think both programs, this this duel, what this duel uh, encompasses for me is gives you such a insight to how things got where they were today and why the duel coming up, why 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 every year, no matter if it's in Iowa City or Ames, mm-hmm. why is it sold out? Why is it so important? Well, there's there's going to be stars stars to be on display, right? I mean, all these guys are superheroes. You know, in, in most people's view, there's going to be guys at the top get knocked off, and, there, and there's going to be new emerging stars, you know, come to light. And um, every year, every yeah. year. So the, the the thing that's also significant is that okay, Iowa leads the nation in attendance, okay, and Iowa State, who hasn't been in the was they haven't been in the top ten in I don't know how long, we're third. Okay, we're still putting we're put, still putting fannies in the in the seats. Both schools are, and uh, uh, you know, so even with everything else, and, 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 and even with things that are, even how um, you know things have been rough at Iowa State, you know, and, and Coach Dresser is trying to uh, bring that uh, back up, but uh, you you you've got to st- you you've got to get, you've got to do it in front of people, mm-hmm. and it makes such a big difference when you're wrestling a, a team, even if. Uh, even I, I remember commenting to Ed Bannock uh, uh, when we were, at, we were at Hilton and we're in the lineups and look up at the crowd and maybe half of them were Iowa fans, right? And there's 13,000 people, whatever the number was. I mean, it, uh, uh, but that's the way it was. I mean, you, um, you know, it, it, it's been easy to be an Iowa wrestling fan, but a little bit more difficult to be an Iowa State wrestling fan. But at the same time, we still, the people have shown up and, and have, have measured pretty well in these attendance uh, records, which has been pretty impressive that the, that, that wrestling staff at Iowa State's been able to do that. You, you uh, pointed on earlier about the you know ten of the ten national titles. I would say one thing that would is maybe like this may sound a little bit odd, but one thing that actually would help both pro. I mean, I think one thing that would help Iowa maybe perform higher, and obviously Iowa State is. You know what's the what's the quote? Uh, Rising ship raises all tides. So when when if Iowa State's pushing Iowa every year, you know there's there hasn't been I don't think t- like eighteen or nineteen in a row. I don't think Tom's lost Iowa State since he's been there, right? No, there's been no. some there's been some close some close duels. Very. But that competition between those two schools naturally raises the level of of, of both to perform higher, obviously. And I think that in state rivalry, the, the hotter it gets and the more cont- contention it gets, ultimately it's going to make both programs win. Yeah, and I think the thing that's different now is that I, I agree with you, the rising tide lifts all boats, okay? So so that's good, but I think Tom Brands is there to think about Iowa, right? And Kevin Dresser is there to think about Iowa State. Um, the the thing that you, you uh, maybe we had back then that you don't have now because there's fewer Iowa kids that make the lineup, Okay, mm-hmm. at, at these programs, you don't have the commonality of the eleven guys that grew up in the in the same era wrestling each other, weekend freestyle tournaments, yeah. training with each other. Uh, that's starting to come back, as I sense here, with the, the amount of kids with the club wrestling, and you know, they're getting to know each other. They're, they're, and, and guys are going their, their their separate ways in college, just like they did back then. But that we we would. Uh, I mean, I, I I knew Randy Lewis since I was uh, uh, in junior high. And um, um, so it was real easy when we were in college to go ahead and not be intimidated and spend time with each other. I don't think there's any of that going on now. Oh, it's very right? siloed. Yeah. 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 So so it's, yeah, very siloed, and, and it's unfortunate in some ways, but it's just the way it is. And uh, and a lot of it's because there's fewer uh, Iowans in the lineup. And I think if if, if uh, you know we're here at IA Russell or whatever, and a lot of Iowa kids are going to see this. They aspire to be in one of these meets. And I'm going to tell you what. Uh, you know, I've, I've got my rear end kicked in these things, and I've had matches where they've gone my way and all that stuff, and it, it, there's nothing better. There's nothing gets you ready. By the time you've wrestled in one of these meets, the national finals is, uh, <laughs> it's not even, not even, the, the, the pressure's not even there. I mean, it, it, it really isn't. What, one thing you said about wrestling, and it's fun, kind of funny, I remember asking Tom Brands one time about, um, 
he wrestled Dan Knight. And, he, and I said, man, you really gave it to him going out. You know, he kind of got a bounce heart. He goes, here's what Tom said. Just what he said, he goes, he, he, goes I, he goes, I owed him. He tech followed me in freestyle state. Yeah. So, like, you still had that competition. Oh, yeah, yeah, And, and yeah. previous, so oh, that, yeah. that rivalry continued. Like, the, the continuance. I'm not going to get, I'm going to ask you a question that's kind of off, off the, not in the documentary, but kind of personal. Is, uh, so you're 26 years old. You guys, you know, young, young, up and coming coaches, uh, wants to be at the best, has already performed the best as an athlete. You lose less than 30 days later, previous uh, 25 to 9 to Iowa, okay? Um, Harold Nichols is in attendance, okay? Both Gable and my coach. Yes, yeah. okay. You guys, you're coming out before before the meet, kind of a before and after. What were you thinking going into this meet? You know, and, and the interview, like, a lot of people think they can win. You thought you, you and your team were going ready to win in the interview, right? Oh yeah. I, so I, what I, were I, you thinking before? Okay, and then after you left, after the conclusion of the dual meet, where was your head then? Do you, were you? You talk about like the we didn't perform the NCAA tournament. Was there some sense of fulfillment that you had kind of done something that you maybe had set out to maybe? No, I, I think no because we were from from the beginning. So I, I'm a really big believer, and you set those high goals, and and uh, I told the the somebody tried to contact me on social media or whatever or why did you get out of wrestling or what did you get out of coaching also i i knew from the beginning all right that i um i wanted to experience a lot of things professionally okay all right so um when i got the job at iowa state i said i'm i'm, I'm gonna go 10 years or a national championship okay and so everything i thought about regard to how can I you know, you know we had some good guys so we, I knew they were I, I knew they were good all right and then we brought in Ben so we, we were we had some guys that were already there that were you know they were doing a lot of the things it took to become really good and I was I was a, a assistant wrestling coach at, at the time I was a recruiting coordinator so I got to know a lot of these guys from in a lot of different angles and I did all the training and and, you know, when I got the job, it was a shock to a lot of people. It wasn't a shock to anybody necessarily in the program. And um, so to answer your question, at that specific time, I was just living it. You know, I remember my skin breaking out and all that stuff. I'd have nervous reactions to I was so focused on, you know, a lot of things I couldn't control, right? But I was so geared towards that because I remember being at Iowa State and the guys that won the national championship in 77, they said, it's the best feeling that you're going to have. I've won national titles, but, you know, winning national championship as a team is good. So I took that to heart, right? And I didn't experience that at, at Iowa State. And, you know, heck, I, I think that, that in 82, if we could have if we could have turned back the hand of the time, if Joe, both Joe and I win in the semis and Mike Mann uh, maybe, you know, um, uh, wins and we, we join Nate as national champions, we could have won that. We still, you still think about the, the ones that got away and all that stuff. And I probably would have had a little bit more fulfilling career and probably maybe not even considered coaching at that time. But, but it drove me to, to, to levels that of, of I, I really want. And, and I, I wanted to bring in that delusional confidence that you need uh, and I needed all right, to become a, a, a national champion. I, I had to take out the guy that made the Olympic team, right? And uh, uh, I had to close the gap, all right, and and uh, be the guy that made the finals four times, all right, and beat me sixteen to six in the in the uh, the duel that, that year. Well, you, you know, where do you where do you drive your confidance from that? Yeah. You gotta be a little bit delusional. Mm -hmm. Well, I believed that. I felt that if we told our our, our goals, and Eddie was perfect for that, all right. Eddie would Eddie was Ed Bannock was like, you know, he had uh, uh, he could he he th he thought that this you know, the set of glasses could win a national championship because <laughs> he coached it, you know, and, and he, he had that type of uh, undying belief in these guys, all right? And we kind of lived that, and we set that goal to win a national title now, all right? No, no, we didn't give ourselves a runway or anything like that. We want to do it now. We want to go over to Iowa City and win now. So when we went over there and, you know, when we won the duel, we talked about from the beginning that, that we were going to taper off a little bit at the end of the season, and it just ended up being the worst thing to do for a, a, you know, a few of our guys, and, and um, we 
lost focus, I think, a little bit, and I put my put put that on me because Chris Campbell's the one that trained me at at, at Iowa State, and he I took over, uh, and we went back to doing a lot of things that Chris Campbell had done at the end of the season, keeping the the level high. You know, Eddie was in agreement with it. We we just changed things up, and actually, the next six years that I coached, uh, uh, I always felt that we had good performances. You know, uh, and, and I, I tell people this is that how do you how do you judge whether you're doing the right thing in the program? Well, I counted that as your winning percentage on, on Saturday. You know, Sean Burmet, I got in a conversation with him the other day, uh, a couple years ago, when he first got the job. I says, keep track of your winning percentage on Saturday. Why is that important? Well, you don't have to. You, you, so, not everybody's going to be in the finals. You're going to be in the wrestlebacks. You're wrestling for your your program, your coaches, uh, you know, your, your goals may be shattered, but you got to go out there and, 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 and keep it going and, and wrestle for your program. I had a lot of guys that, that, that finished their careers with, with wins at the end and third place finishes and all that, just as proud as, tho- as those that they have at national championships. But there's no preparation for a three-day tournament, particularly when you, sh- when you travel on Monday and Tuesday. You're actually in, that, you're in the game for, for five days. Well, you can't replicate that, okay, during the course of the season. And by the t- some guys are, so, are, are worn out by the time they get to Friday morning, and that's why you see so many upsets in the quarters. And, and uh, uh, we, we, I, I just felt that that was the, the, the focus that we need to keep is, is to go back. And we lost our, we lost our focus a little bit, and, and um, I, I take, took responsibility for that, but you just can't go back. I mean, some guys were seniors, and some guys never had a chance to wrestle again, or, or whatever. And it's not like we totally fell off the, but we, but we felt that we could have been better. Uh, we we could have been the team that we were, uh, uh, and Hilton Coliseum that night. We just weren't at that tournament, and uh, we had a lot of things to correct. And but the other thing too, um, that I, um, and this was this is why it was so kind of kind of tough to be involved with uh, from from my standpoint of you know kind of because I was engaged I was involved and you're in it you know <laughs> but, but you're also putting it together but one of the questions I asked myself well who else is going to be able to tell this story who else can bring everybody together who else can who else can go ahead and do this efficiently and and uh, uh, and, and, and get the people to trust them to go ahead and do this and you know so I, I, I said okay I'm going to do it I'm going to have wear this hat but, but as far as being somebody who was in it, after not winning uh, the national championship that year and finishing fourth, we were in a we were in a um, hotel room, and you know you have a party afterwards, and and uh, we spent about forty five minutes in a hotel room, and I just you know I go I don't know what happened, but I'm gonna figure it out. I got I feel like I've let you guys down. We were so much better than that, and you know it got you know guys crying and you know I, I knew they cared all right I look back at that and I go man you know such a it's such a tough opportunity to, to uh, lose because you very very few times do you have teams you know I probably had three teams that could win national titles they were actually one of them in my mind right but uh, but uh, the next year we had a team that could win and we obviously had one in the 88 that could, could have won as well but you know, as a coach, you get very few opportunities to, to uh, uh, you know, really run one up the flagpole here. And uh, uh, we, we kind of uh, missed on that. But I knew they cared, all right? That's the one thing about it. I knew they cared, all right? So we didn't have to say uh, we, we visited about it that night. Uh, no finger pointing, no no this or that. But it's just I, could, I just told them, it's just, we are going to be so much better next year. We're, we, we're just going to we're going to do it. We, we, you know, we still have that that unbridled belief but the following year I, there, there were no pep talks there were no you know there wasn't any loss of faith if we didn't do well we got beat four times in duels but we never uh, lost more than five matches in a duel all right we were going in places like Penn State Arizona State Oklahoma State Iowa net, you know won, won five matches in each gym all right did a lot of away wrestling out there it made us tougher and, and you know we were ready to go the next year so do you think that do you think that 87 national tournament happens? On, on two fronts with number one, th- how much, you know, you actually beating Iowa that year, right? What kind of belief did that put into the, you had a, a unwavering belief that your guys could win and coach Bannock did too. Did that put a, 
a burst of belief in your program and the people coming in and the faltering or, or as you are underperforming at 86, you know, and then you're going into a dual meet. You said you lost four or five duels, four duels. Yeah. Did, did you beat Iowa that year? Yeah, I would beat him in the first one. Okay. So, so you already, there's a repeat. You guys were, I think, ranked fourth going into the 87 and yeah. you had, I think you won by 12 or 15 points. 25. 25, okay. So fourth place to, or fourth rank. I don't know how I remember that. Does, yeah. Well, I would remember it too. Does, <laughs> does I guess, that without without the ups and downs of 86, does 87 happen like that? Well, there were no, there weren't many uh, uh, downs in 86, except for the end. We were 19 and one in duels, right? We, we, we wanted to find out that night whether we were the team that was not going to heck out of North Carolina and Oklahoma and Oklahoma State and, and you know, you and I. Are but working. you still weren't picked to win, right? Well, yeah, we, I, the next year we weren't picked to win. Uh, that's what I'm saying, yeah, though. So there, I'm saying you weren't picked to there win weren't in 86. Many down, there weren't many downs. The downs, I'm talking about the performance of the NCAA tournament, right? Yeah, the, right. The, the, ups was, of, yeah, and the ups of beating them at the duel, which had, I don't know when the last time happened previously. Can I interrupt that. you for a second? We're two years away from Tommy Chesbro, all right, in 84, losing his job. He beats Iowa in the duel and doesn't beat Iowa to stop the streak. Yeah. All right. In 84. And uh, that's the team that had Mark Perry senior on it and mm-hmm. all that stuff. And they, 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 uh, uh, John was on that team. They, they, I think they beat Iowa pretty handily. Uh, uh, maybe I don't know if John was on that team or not. Yeah. But, but, yeah, but, but anyway, so, uh, but Tommy lost his job at Oklahoma state. All right. He's the coach of the year. Finished the second in the country, and nationals are in. Um, maybe I, I can't remember, but, but we're, we were not too far away from that. So I'm just thinking to myself, I ain't freaking uh, gonna be in this uh, <laughs> gig too long, <laughs> taking a, a, a number two team and finishing fourth. All right, and again, remember our our, our you weren't gonna get anything past our alumni either. I mean, those are guys are all all pretty salty and accomplished, right? So. I, I had, uh, I, 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 maybe the fact that I grew up in Ames and knew a lot of these people and that, that I, I just, and I didn't want to be that guy, right? I didn't want to be that guy. So it's like, you know, and, 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 and even after you win, you, you, you got to, you know, keep that, that up a little bit, <laughs> not a little bit, a lot, right? There, there's just, there's just a different level of pressure that you don't see today mm-hmm. in, in that Iowa State program, right? Because of, of uh, you know, our coach won six national titles. And I always say, say this is that Harold Nichols was uh, uh, Nick, as we called him. Um, you know, after a while, you're not going against the one national title, you're going against the six, and you can't do anything about that one, one year at a time. And uh, I don't know if, if uh, um, my whole experience here with that, that tradition was I had, I knew what the tradition was and I had high expectations of myself. I knew what the expectations were and it was like, we're going to try it this as hard as we can. We were, we were outgunned in a lot of ways as far as what the program was and when Gable really had it rolling. I mean, you go recruit against Gable and it was like, uh, you know, um, you'd be there and you'd be talking to the guy and all that stuff and you call back on the phone. Well, you know, Gable showed up and it's like, dad came home You've been in a, in a, it's like that scene with the truck driver and the little kid running to the, the truck driver that gets out of the truck dad <laughs> <laughs> but 87 i mean gable they had the x put on their singlets i mean everybody yeah. had anointed iowa it's a it's a done deal they're just gotta show up right well, so with that they, they i think this uh time period in 86 gave them the confidence to do that and I disagree with Dan. He said, well, I shouldn't have never done that and all that stuff. You absolutely should have done it, right? It, it, to the fact that you put nine, to, nine in a row together and you threw the X on there, you don't, get to the, you don't get to the 10, all right, unless you had the nine. And you're paying homage to the guys who got you there. Mm-hmm. I like it, right? Yeah. I, like, I like that delusional confidence. And, 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 I, and, and Gable comes back and says, well, we, we did, you know. We, when I saw that, um, you know, I had the, a, a, a poster just like the poster I'm giving you guys here. Uh, I had a poster of that. I put it on my closet. But if it wasn't that, I was going to put something else on my closet that, that, that would rec- re- remind me and give me a reason to get up every day, right, and, and, uh, and, and go at it. So uh, 
I, I love the fact that they did that, right? And, you know, our little fan base kind of st- st- that we had out there in the tournament that year probably, you know, uh, they, you know, they had a circle through it, you know, the X, you know, <laughs> which is fine. Those are good rivalry type That's things, great. all right? It's fantastic, okay? You'd love to see those days come back. Yes. But, but uh, where people have the confidence to go ahead and, and, and do that. So I, I love the fact that he did that, not because it really motivated us all that much, right? But it's just... Yeah, I think he I think he should have absolutely done that. I get, I guess I disagree with him sometimes, and he says that in front of Iowa State people, but I don't know if he really means. It. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, with people that you know, you're, you're promoting the, this duel, and and there's people that out there that you know know the history of our sport, and know the history of this rivalry. Um, I was two years old when this happened, so I obviously was not there. But I grew up driving over to Ames. I grew up in Ogden, right, and and sitting in that line. And um, uh, yourself a season ticket, man. Yeah. So like getting getting it sitting in that line like with my dad, you know, I just got done farming, you know, going over that duel, I guess. But like, so I'm trying to like, if if someone watching this that is, you know, just went to Iowa, Penn State last year, or they went to Iowa, Iowa State last year, and there's there's that rivalry is a little bit back. They're not really. I mean, there's no there's no wins for it, right? For Iowa State to hang their hat on, but like you can feel that energy when you go back to that duel. So I'm trying to like. Somebody that has no clue what the heck you know you're talking about, right? That maybe might be a you know sophomore, junior in high school, you know, connecting that 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 wrestler or maybe even younger to this era of like, hey, you watch this, like, because that's that's what's happening almost right now. Tony, you know, I would I would tell you this is that the the, the one of the things that the takeaways from this has been, I think that this has an audience, not only beyond wrestling beyond the state of Iowa, but anybody who's ever had a rival in any sport is going to understand what's going on here. Again, when you hear these guys talk about each other reverently uh, uh, in 35 years later, Mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, the the single mother that uh, is is trying to help the the sport, you know, dad's not in the picture or whatever, and and, and trying to get, uh, um, you know, to help their, their young boys, uh, you know, understand, you know, to, to, to grow in the sport like we know that, that the sport can provide. Sport can't be the dad, all right, but the bottom line is, is that, you know, help them in, in their, you know, um, you know, get a lot of, around a lot of lot positive influences. They're either teammates or whatever. They're going to, 35 years later, oh, I get it. This is why I want my kid out for wrestling. If it gets a guy to go ahead and consider to be an official four or five years longer, right, if it gets a guy to consider becoming an assistant coach for a little bit more longer, understanding the long-term impact that you can have uh, with people through the sport, right? And, you know, it, uh, uh, I, I'm going to do a, a broadcast with, uh, with uh, Ryan Warner um, from um, Change My Life. I always gave him a hard time. He says, that, you know, wrestling didn't change my life. I changed my life to be successful at wrestling, Right. And that's what, when you hear, hear these, I mean, I love his show. He does a great job of, of, of not being critical of him, but I just give him a hard time about, you know, what are, we, what are we really saying here, right? A lot of these guys made a lot of significant changes in their life to be successful in the sport. That never changes, right? That never changes. You have to make, uh, you know, and, and if, you know, I heard Nick Saban say this one time, the Alabama football coach says, you know, once you've decided to do something, you know, goal like this 99 percent of the decisions are already made for you mm. you know you know you, you, you you've already made that decision because you have this goal so uh i think anybody who's ever had a rival tony all right who's ogden's big rival back then perry or whatever or, yeah yeah, whatever. It, yeah so you go down to perry you're gonna go you're gonna go treat this but if you saw that guy five years later you'd say hey dude how you doing what's going on yeah. you know what get up i Really love working, uh, going against you. Remember that match when, when this happened and that happened? I can't tell you how many times I've had those type of experiences at nationals or, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more fun position because I'm out there still doing media. But the, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I hope that some of those guys that uh, beat the heck out of me goes, well, you know, I beat the heck out of him. All right. See that guy on TV? All right. <laughs> I, I whipped his ass. All right. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be right. You yeah. Know? So uh, it's okay. Right, it's okay to have a rival. It's okay to get excited about it. It's okay to get fired up and, and have those nerves and that nervous energy and all that stuff. It just makes you better. And to not have that experience doesn't really have 
you know, and, and it could be a, 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 a JV match or something like that. You know, when you walk into a gym and you know there's a rival, you smell that popcorn and you smell that, yeah, that, uh, that rubber mat uh, in a gym, right? Let's get it on, right? It is, it, this, is, this, is what it, this is what it's about. And the, the whole, um, um, and I think that you, have, you see that with the, with the other big meets like Ohio State, Penn State, Ohio State, um, Iowa, Penn State, Iowa, you know, all that, you know, Oklahoma State, of course, in there. You, they want it to be big. There's nothing more sad than going to an Oklahoma, Oklahoma State meet, right? And, and watching what, uh, what used to be a, a, a great, great program uh, not have the, 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 the wherewithal to make it a, 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 a good match. Yeah. It's kind of sad. But <laughs> well, but the, yeah. the, the rivalry. Great, the great one, there was, we had a great match last Oklahoma, Oklahoma State we did on ESPN. was was really a fun one. Yeah, we needed a, Oklahoma State needed a pin to win. But um, uh, but, this, but they're not the, the, there's not the following the involved, but the, the rivalry's petered out. You could say fizzled out a little bit just because Oklahoma State, Oklahoma State, Oklahoma, or yeah, Iowa because, State. No, Oklahoma State, Iowa, uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. Just because there hasn't been that tension, like it's kind of yeah. like okay, Oklahoma State's going to win, right? Yeah. Um. You obviously have a, a lot of. Uh, first of all, thank you for doing this for the sport more than anything. I think this is this is the kind of things that I've done, I think you done a selfless job doing it. You could have took a. You could have took a. As executive producer, you could have took a. You know, a lot of people maybe would have slandered the story. I think you're extremely fair, and I think you told both sides um, the ability for guys to still. There's still some open wounds. Yeah, I mean, this kind of also shows you that how important this was to a lot of people. There's some, a lot of people still have open wounds from 35 years ago. Um, maybe that match. I mean, Matt England, you talked about, but there's a lot of things you've seen maybe happen there, um, advancing their life or further in their careers. What's some of the biggest, you obviously had a lot of learning, you're 26 at the time, and maybe it's not just then, but what's some of the, what are some of the biggest things you learned from your process of leading young men and coaching during your tenure at Iowa State that you still use applicable today in your life? Well, I think I think, uh, um, I think I tried to get better at it, but, uh, you know, I, I was a young coach. You know, that you say leading young men, well, I was a young man, right? So I was kind of put in a little bit different uh, role, but I think that it, you know, we had success on the mat. Um, I think a lot of guys got coaching jobs at a young age because of what happened for me. Okay. And, and maybe to the detriment of people that have, you know, maybe put in a little bit more time and, and, and all that, but there's, this is a sport where you just need the energy, right? Uh, by the time I was 32, 33 years of age, I wasn't feeling it, you know? Um, and, I, and, and, and I, it, it was compensation and things like that, like having a contract. I was you know, on a year-to-year contract probably. But that, 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 those, those weren't the, the important things. Those weren't what drove us. That, those relationships with those guys, it, it was just so fun to be in a college wrestling room. All right? I, I can't tell you. When you, see, when you get around a bunch of guys that – and I feel the same way about this project. You know, when you get in, in a room and you go – you know what? I think this guy's going to go ahead and be pretty good. He's he's starting to you know the last month and a half of the season he's been really doing what we, what we expect him to do, and he can he can get away. He can do this. He can that, and he's getting tough, right? And you're going well. That's why I feel about this project. You know, we're we're coming down to the last month and a half where a lot of people are going to see it and all that. And I go, I know how it's affected a lot of people, and I go, you know, I think we've really got something here. But you don't you don't know. You don't know if a thousand people will watch it or hundred thousand people. Will that really doesn't become as important as the fact that you did the work to become, to put a good project together. And when I look at these guys that I coached and, you know, and, and again, I was a young coach. I, and then I, then I got married when I uh, coaching that we didn't have any children back then. I was living a totally different lifestyle than I, than I am today as a, you know, father of three and, and two adult girls. Now it has started having grandchildren, you know, grand, you know, they're, um, you know, so it, it's, uh, it's just a different facet of my life. Again, that's why it's a time capsule. Um, <clears throat> I just uh, was trying to do everything I could to keep my feet moving, to be not necessarily immediately, because I couldn't be compared to, to, to either my predecessor, Coach Nichols, and uh, 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 my, my main rival, Dan Gable. But when you think about it at the end of the day, you know, Gable didn't have many rivals. 
and he certainly didn't have many guys that that uh, put teams up that that you know those pictures that you see of Dan going nuts in 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 uh, uh, Carver Hawkeye. Well, it's you know it's Brooks Simpson pinning my guy, right? Okay, though that they mean he's he's as surprised as anybody could be because that, that meet in eighty whatever it was eighty eight or whatever we, we 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 had him all right we were up you know um, but the bottom line is it didn't work out that way but that's what's the great thing about having a rival yeah uh, and, and uh, there's a moment in this thing that I, that I I'm on my team's shoulders and Gable comes over to shake my hand and I I had that sinking feeling about man I I wish I was off these guys shoulders right now right knowing what you know today and what what you know he's accomplished and it, it looked kind of uh it wasn't the it, it wasn't the uh i should have i i should have been but what we were excited we hadn't beat him in a while um and and uh we were going to iowa city in three weeks and and try and try you know to win a national title and we were on at that point in time you to answer your question we felt like we were on pace right so now we just you know we're on pace and then we can rest up a little bit then we're gonna go there and and we just couldn't get the pilot light started again and with the, the field so so Gabe will come over shake your hand knowing how his psyche works do you think that maybe he did that because he wanted like you to know that he saw you there like like acknowledge like what was going on at that moment like or, or do you just think it was just natural just to shake it like to go up and say okay i'm acknowledge like shaking your hand i'm acknowledging this whole situation at the time i'm not just dismissing it like you know most guys maybe just walk away no. just how, how he works his motivation well, I I didn't I didn't certainly want to create any motivation for him. So the uh, uh, I know it wasn't intentional, but know. on his on his behalf. No, I I think I think he was, you know, shell shocked. No, I don't think it, that I I don't think that at all. I mean, because you look at him in, in this meet, he's not demonstrative at all, right? He's he's a little bit subdued, and he, and and uh, uh, we talk about that a little bit, but you know, th- th- again. We wanted to take them out, right? That's what a rival <laughs> wants to do to somebody else. They want to take them out, right? And and let the chips fall where they may, and uh, uh, and that's what kind of what I like about what's happening in the rivalry right now with Iowa State. You know, they they, they want to they want to win. I mean, the, uh, I mean, we digress a little bit. Tom Brands probably still has it on his goal list that to, 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 the Iowa State meet is the most important meet of the year, right? Makes his life a, a heck of a lot easier if he's able to go ahead and continue to win. And I promise you, Coach Dresser is thinking the same thing as well. We we can get our fan base excited because we go beat Iowa, yeah. right? So it 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 exists. High table stakes. Yeah, the high, 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 high table. So you're not, you, you're not gonna. But I think that our guys went out and wrestled really well that day. You see some of these matches, and um, you know there were very few instances where we kind of didn't wrestle to our ability but we we showed up and we battled them and uh we won some tough matches we were in shape you know and and uh we you know that it, it uh, i think he appreciate I, I think he just appreciated the fact that that he's got uh that we that we showed are showing a lot of energy and some progress right and i gotta tell you that 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 uh one of the biggest uh one of the neatest things that we were able to uncover on this, a couple things, a couple names that you you're probably one you're aware of, right? But the other one you're not aware of, John O. Marks. Did you ever know about John O. Marks before this? Mm-mm. John O. Marks was the recruiter for Iowa. Okay, Brad Penrith tells a, a, a great story uh, great, in this. Okay, and about his uh, recruitment. But you know, Gable had a recruiting coordinator before anybody else considered. You know, I was the recruiting coordinator. But it was well. I mean, Marx was doing this in the '70s for David, David, uh, Gary uh, Kurtlmeyer. So we unearthed a little bit of that that a lot of the average Iowa fan doesn't know. I mean, I knew John O. Marx. He was actually in Ames. In fact, a lot of people think that he had a lot to do with bringing the spy. Gary, right? He was the spy. Hmm. <laughs> right. Prince came to Iowa for for books only. Yeah. Yeah. Really. Big argument between. So anyway, we, the, yeah. we're not going to unearth that. But it's it's well worth uh, second episode is well worth watching just to. to uh, Penrith is fantastic in this thing. And so, uh, uh, and uh, my wife's favorite is, is Greg Randall. <laughs> he, uh, he didn't really know what to expect. And all of a sudden, he's, he, once he got on there, he was, he was gold, all right? Uh, he, 
make a case for him as the Odell. We knew Royce was going to be funny. We knew knew uh, Royce is in a different yeah. different light too. I mean, Royce, yeah. you see, you Royce, know, Royce is he was still a little bit humbled. I mean, he got beat beat pretty bad in this duel. Me, Royce is wonderful in this thing, and and uh, see the other side that, of Royce. Well, yeah, you see the the, the guy I know, and and uh, uh, we've actually become pretty close since then. So um, the uh, um, I think one of the things that uh, Again, the, 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 it's, it's so good to see the guys who won these matches show great empathy. And, and you know, sometimes that they were being interviewed uh, three states apart at different times, they throw, throw great empathy for the guy that, uh, that, that, that got beat and what that guy meant to them as far as a rival and how that drove them. And, uh, you know, again, like we're talking 12 national champions in this, in this, this group here, they were, they were fun. And, and, uh, they, they, they respected each other. And I think that that's really important too, but, um, you know, sometimes that just comes over, over, over time and maturity. Do you, do you think like, uh, as wrestlers, we, we always, there's always that point in our career that we just, we think about like when we don't, we don't expect that we're going to think about it. Right. Do you, you know, when you think that this docu-series of getting it out to the public and people are watching it and they get to understand it just as much as you do. Right. Do you think it's, is it going to be like a, a relief that people get to see it for you? Like, is it going, are you going to be, is it something that you think that you're going to be able to put past you, the, the athletes, maybe not you, but like uh, maybe some of the hurt that you had from that season. It's just like, Hey, I was able to just, we were able, we were all able to tell it and now we can kind of move on or is it all, you know, it's always going to be a part of your life, but you get no, what I'm I trying th- to say. Like it's uh, I think every one of these guys has moved on in some way, shape or form. Yeah, they moved on from it, but they talk about it like as yesterday. Yeah, you know, to, to uh, just like you would when you when you talk about you know memorable matches they had. I always tell people this: you always kind of gauge yourself of, of uh, well, you know, I can't tell you how many times I had guys that, that uh, walked up to me as well. I wrestled Gable in high school, right? Well, that's his memory of the sport. Gable goes on to have all the success. Well, he wrestled him in high school, and that's his connection to the sport. You know, always have a deep connection to the sport because of that he wrestled Dan Gable and. You know, hundreds of guys have told me they wrestled <laughs> and Gable or where they were in the practice room. They might have been in the practice room or with them at one moment in time, but their their, their memories of, of they, they, you know, they view themselves there. The other thing that, that um, you know, you t- we tend to, I told my daughters this one time, and I think it's really true. I tell them all, all the time. I says, you'll always remember yourself, your esteem. You know, it's kind of like that, that, you know, you, you hit that go to the fair and you hit that thing down and it goes up so high and, you know, and then it goes up a little higher, right? And it, it, keeps, it keeps on pushing something up there and then that's what your highest was, okay? That's what it's like with physical conditioning and your self-esteem. People will always remember themselves, right? Whether you put on a few pounds or whatever, you know, you get a little age in your eye or whatever, you'll always remember yourself esteem-wise at the highest conditioning level that you were ever at. I get you into trouble sometimes. Right? <laughs> that's a really good. That's a really good. Yeah. yeah. So it, uh, uh, and then that's what it was like for these guys. You know that 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 you know they're both they're all part of national championship teams. Um, you know they had uh, you know several you know forty four all Americans amongst the twenty guys. You know and uh, uh, you know I, I think about a guy like Matt Eglund who, who visited with us. This ended up being the last match of his career. All right, and, and you know things got tough for him and all that and but but I can't the year before he was the reason why they won the national tournament he, he, he was the eighth seed and gets into the finals and uh, beats knocks out uh the number one seed uh, Mark Perry senior right so it, it's like that type of that, that swing right there ended up being the difference between you know first and, and second in a lot of ways for their their program and so he was one of the heroes that they had and you know it's just it's what happens in a, in a career. We can't always, always decide, you know, the way we, we go out and all that. But um, um, I was just so thankful that, that uh, he got up and, you know, and did this interview. And, and it's emotional. It's yeah. probably cathartic for, for him. And when you know the whole story, um, we, 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 we take you there a little bit. But, but, uh, but I, like I said, he's in every episode. And uh, and there's there's funny things that he, he he brings out here about teammates and talking about Royce and and uh, like I said I we 
the only thing that we could really worry about here with this tank and Tony was, is it going to be good? What, can we can we make a good story out of this? Not about that we didn't have it, you know the, the guy the four thousand minutes of interviews took us to where how we wanted to finish this, and um, and you, it, it it's the duel, but it's really more about the two, not not that duel. Mm-hmm. There's eleven different story arcs that develop after the last hand is raised, um, but technically, uh, with with John Myers's connections, uh, we were able to go ahead and, and, and get Stephen P. Arkle, who did the, the the color for this thing. He's won twenty two Emmys, mm-hmm. right? Same type of heavyweight that did the final sound for this. If you ever look up uh, YouTube, uh, Coca Cola, uh, Andy Warhol exhibit. Uh, the Yessian sound people, uh, Michael Yessian has done this, the, 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 his company did the sound for this. You know, connections of John's in, in the industry. Wrestling people, actually, uh, Stephen P. Arkel's not, you'd notice that it's Stephen P. Arkel, Sparkle, <laughs> <laughs> and he's in color. That's and cool. he's 22, two, you know, so his, uh, his uh, uh, he's an, actually an Australian. And uh, they, there were so many things that, and, and his family started buying, or originally he, he married a woman from Northwest Iowa, and they started, uh, they bought, just bought a farm that, that, while we were doing this. So there, there's an Iowa connection there. Yeah. And uh, uh, so anyway, we wanted, we wanted to be the highest quality we could possibly make it. And, uh, uh, it, it, you know, John and I are the ones that shot it. And uh, we got a lot of help from our attorney, Dustin Miller, who helped us with the rights uh, from Nymaster. Uh, Chris McGowan uh, from uh, Siouxland Chamber of Commerce also helped us a lot. But the actual nuts and bolts of putting this together is, was, the, was the talent and dedication of, of, uh, of John Myers and, and uh, you know, me trying to get everybody together. Do I'm not going to let you off the hook yet, though. I'm not, I, gotta, I, I, I got three questions <laughs> at yeah, least here. Keep going. I'm, I got I, I, time. I, you and I talked about this off, offline, but... You're 26, okay? And you just, you know, I think a lot of times, especially in the sport of wrestling, you know, you, you can go to football and their sports. You know, Bill Belichick wasn't an all-star. Like, there's a lot of times just because you were a national champion didn't didn't mean that you're going to be a great coach, right? So, obviously, you had the impact on your athletes. Your your record speaks for itself. Your insight. What made you, What made you, in my opinion, how did you become – a great coach so quickly like what 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 did you do i don't think i did come become a great coach so quickly i think the, the other thing too that that I, I learned real quickly is that i learned and i got what from watching my coach uh nick he, he never if you had five meaningful conversations with him during the course of your career that was the over and under right okay Whatever, you know what i'm saying he wasn't like you i mean these guys they talk a lot now i mean there's a lot that you know there's there just wasn't a lot of that uh, back then. He and he was very uh, a quiet man anyway, and stoic would be the better way of, of putting it. But I learned from him, and I think Dan learned the same thing. You just got to be okay with not being the guy. I look at a lot of programs right now, and everything runs through the energy of one guy. Okay, when you think about that for a second, that's an impossible amount of wattage to be able to hold up or, or stay at that level. And I figured out that, that I got to be okay with allowing others to get the credit, number one, others to, you know, hey, coach, I, I've got more credit for this than I've ever probably even deserved over a, over a lifetime. I'm a national champion coach. I mention it every time I come out to the broadcast. I'm a national champion wrestling coach, okay? Okay, big deal. Well, what I it did, is a big deal. Well, it is. It, it, <laughs> it, it was a big deal to me. It was my goal. But the, here, here's the thing about it is, is that, Every coach that I hired had better credentials than me. Les Anderson, two-time uh, national champion, you know, long-time coach. Ed Banning, Olympic champion, four, three-time national champion. My brother Joe, Kevin Jackson, you know, um, maybe with the, there's probably one coach I had that, that that didn't, you know, a couple coaches that I had were that were not as credentialed, but that the, uh, uh, but they were good coaches, so. You know, and I wanted them to take the credit. And so there's something magical that happens when you've got that, that young, young coach, that energy, that, uh, that passion to help a guy get better. Um, and combine that with the experience of a, of a head coach that, you know, can kind of referee that relationship, you know, the, 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 the work you're, and 
and it all started with we just had good guys that came to Iowa State to become champions that had been done there before. And we felt that we, if you, if you did these things, I think there was a little bit more development back then because a lot of guys came into school a lot younger than what they do now. Um, and they're, they're a little bit, uh, uh, they may have not been developed as, you know, they, they, they had some things that were missing, but, you know, once that showed up, once the maturity and the strength and the, and the right techniques showed up uh, uh, in their repertoire, they were able to go ahead and get better real quick. And nothing beats competition, right? And nothing beats whatever you do. I said this before, uh, you know, r national champions. I mean, it, it's always going to be about who's the toughest guy. You know, there's a lot of ways you can show that you're tough. We always talk, you know, some people get in enamored with the physical conditioning, the strength and all that stuff, uh, the body, you know, uh, getting the, your, the best body and all that stuff. But you got to have the heart of a thief, man. You want to take something from somebody who's worked harder for that than you have. You want to steal somebody's lunch money they've worked their butt off to get that lunch money, but you're going to take it, right? Why? Because like Saban said, you've already determined that you're going to be a national champion. So that's, it's easy to steal somebody's lunch money because it's your goal too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, we don't sit there and get on the scale and go, well, I wonder how many, uh, 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 how much this guy's worked, how hard this guy's worked this year. You get on the scale and say, I'm here to win. Yeah. Right. And there's an element of that. And that takes a tough guy to do that. And sometimes the delusional confidence is what you need, right, to keep yourself in that mind space, all right, so that you'll eventually do the work that it takes to get there. That's the most important thing, is that if I set that goal and become delusionally confident and willing to sacrifice for it, I'll do the work, right? Now the question is, do I have a good plan or am I being taught the right techniques, that, you know, you know, but fortunately at Iowa State at that point in time, we were, we were doing the techniques that work on Saturday night. Mm -hmm. That's what I, I, I believe is that, you know, to teach e even the high school kids, you know, uh, you know, you know, teach them in junior high the things that you'll see on Saturday night. Like today, I mean, today's you know, coaching now compared to back then and what you have to deal with with kids is you, you talk about like believing in yourself and being delusional. And it's harder, I think, probably than ever to be in that one try, you know, one track mind, you know, being because you have all the outside things on your phone of of you know, people yeah. commentating on, you know, who this wrestler is going to be, their rankings and stuff like that. Um, I, I'm curious, Adam, like you know, as someone that's is is you know within a club, you got kids, you know, that um, you know, Nolan's high level right now, and obviously you got kids at the club too. Is like, how do you how do you keep that self doubt that it's just always somebody's probably it could be a simple thing as like you're ranked fourth, say in our rankings, but you feel like you're number one. Like, gonna, how do you actually was going to be a default to the question to coach? Cause the I was, my question was going to be his daughters have been super successful in cross country. Right. So my question was going to be you as being a co coach, you level, then you're now you're a dad, but you're also a coach. How did you communicate with your daughters? to be successful in their sport. Yep. Well, my, my, my daughter, Grace, was a... Unbelievable. Uh, yeah, so she, she was a multi-time state champion and won, like, cross country in 4A, 3A, and 2A and when we moved. And and uh, she, she she ran... Against, she was probably easily one of the top five or ten runners in the state probably in, in the, at that time, and there's a lot of really good uh, runners. And, and uh, I remember having a conversation with her. You know, I used to drive her to school from Perry to Dowling and uh, where she uh, ran her uh, freshman year and... And it was kind of funny because uh, um, she had 4'11", and she, would, she had size 10 feet. She's 4'11", kind of like 85 pounds. And, Jesus. and uh, well, we had her playing basketball all summer. She didn't distance run at all. She went for, out for cross country in eighth grade. And uh, uh, I was uh, talking, I spent the time, we had about a 40-minute drive, and I spent time talking to her about this and, and uh, because she was, I called up the cross country coach, Father Kirby, and said, uh, "It's eight, August third. I says my daughter just got done with basketball. I says, what can I, can, can she come and and run uh, for you guys?" And, and he goes, "Well, we've been running since June. All right, we've been having practices since June." I go, "Well, she's not a bad runner. You know, she's good, good, good shape and all that stuff. We've been playing basketball all all year, and and uh, she ends up uh, going to the team. The first few days she's with the slow group, and then she's next day she's you know with the 
you know, faster group. And then pretty soon she's making the team on a state championship cross country. It's no doubt they're going to win the state title that year. And Carissa Schweitzer, who was the Olympian and, and uh, uh, five-time national champion, went on to have a wonderful career at uh, Mizzou, uh, was, her, was her teammate and all that stuff. So pretty soon she's running behind Carissa the whole time. And uh, so I'm – as a dad, I'm looking through the rankings and the times and all yeah, this stuff. Great. All the girls are across the state and all this stuff. So, you know, as I'm talking to her, I'm going. And one thing I observed at that at cross country is is that you always have, you've got these kids that go out there too quick, right? And you've got the kids that all of a sudden you're the, the ones that bothered me were the ones that that ran real fast in the last 200 yards. And you sit there and go, if if they could have, it was it, it's about. I mean, it's going to be painful whatever you do in, 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 the, in that sport, and you're going to finish strong. But I always think about, well, if you had that much energy left at the end of the end of the run, what would have been happening if you would have done it eight, 800 meters mm-hmm. earlier, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and, I, and I've had this conversation with her. I says, if, if you're going to finish fifth in the state, let's do it by, by you know, letting the, the top four runners run you down, all right? as opposed to you coming from Jason. behind at 10th and getting that, that up to fifth. So you're going to finish fifth. Let's go ahead and run with the best, right? And, you know, she had one of those wonderful races there where she's, you know, with, you know, Carissa was 20, 30 yards out in front of her, you know, leading the race like she normally does. And then she, uh, 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 you know, just had that moment where she got afraid of the people who were behind her catching her. And as a result, she passed Carissa and, Next moment we see her, she's, you know, 30, 40 yards ahead of everybody, and she wins the state meet, right? As a freshman. <laughs> well, in, in cross country, in, in, in young ladies cross country, it, a lot of the freshmen and sophomores do really, really well, right? Because there's obviously with the body changes and all that stuff, it's, it ends up. And I, we didn't know any of this stuff. We just, like, happy that our you know, girl wins state title. Absolutely. And I call up my mom. I says, Mom, I says, uh, 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 Grace, uh, uh, won the, the state meet and my mom goes you know well, my mom is you know, so from 1975 through 1985 11 years right she watched his son in the state finals or the national finals or both for 11 straight years <laughs> <laughs> and she goes like this she goes so this would have been she would have been like 75 or so she's 85 now she well yeah no it would have been like she's like 70 she goes well it's about time <laughs> we haven't won anything in 11 years or whatever, whatever that was. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> you know, my mom was not prone to, to bragging or anything like that. It was just about time. So when did you see – was there a moment in time I had those discussions you, you saw the, the switch turn in your daughter's mind? That she started like uh, – yeah, She was not, so not like, raw. Oh, yeah, Dad. Like. Yeah, she was so raw, and I don't know how much it was, you know, but we'd have these, you know, conversations, and, and, uh, and like, like she won the district as well, and, and – uh, it was really weird because uh, Carissa went the wrong direction following the, you know, Carissa was always ahead, went the wrong direction and uh, ran and, the, and ran down our, uh, basically a rabbit hole, but it wasn't on the course. They lost sight of the gator, right? Oh. Right. And she ran down the wrong way. And so Grace followed her and the girl from Dow Valley followed her at districts. This is over in Council Bluffs. And she came back and Carissa panicked and started running as fast as she could, right? And Grace was like, mm, 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 mm. you know, it's just all of a sudden, you know, and Krista got too tired at, at, at doing that. And I think it bothered her uh, a little bit. And then, you know, she almost stopped in the race. And uh, Grace ends up winning the district because she just kept her composure. You know, it's just, it's just you know, that's so much a part of it. So I had that, that parent, parental experience uh, uh, with my daughters. And, and uh, my, my oldest daughter went to West Point, where she's equally as proud as her is that, going to the military academy and, and uh, uh, being one of the, like, 9% of women who graduate from there. She was uh, one of the leaders there, and, and a lot of it was because uh, 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 she just, I, I don't know, I, I raised them to kind of be tough, you know. You know, just, just they, 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 they I, I had a wrestler's coaching mentality about all of it. Uh, uh, it. It didn't always work out really great, you know. But, uh, you know, you'd be in there telling them something and, and, you, and you'd flip wrestling in there instead of, like, uh, basketball. You'd say, uh, you're, you know, when you're out there wrestling, you know, in, 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 you know I, you're not out there wrestling. You're in track. Right? So <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was, your mind changed. What would your advice yeah. be for, like, a, a dad that's 
as a, a either a young kid or a kid in high school, like how how to manage a relationship so it doesn't become it just can't be about you, right? I already told you. I told you know just like you know that my brother's going through that with his son, uh, Colby, and uh, this is Colby. I've got my arm raised as many times as I'm ever going to get him raised. So so it's not like it, it, the one thing you recognize, and I think all these guys that experience uh, success and had kids and you know, it, it can't be about you because it wasn't about your parents when you were doing it. So um, I think the parents that get, you know, our dad was as, as, uh, uh, as active as any parent could be back in that era. He gave us a lot of opportunities to, to go see a lot of the, of, the, of the country and wrestle other competition and, you know, went to Western regionals, went to Eastern regionals, you know, Central regionals and, and, and uh, you know, went to Olympic trials when I was a junior. You know that they got got to be we went to the you know the camps up in Okaboji with Gable and Peckham and Martin and and uh, uh, so we had a lot of opportunities to be good uh, at this and um, um, but he was really methodical in the way he he approached it you know because but he asked the guys and we lived in Ames there and we'd always ask well what does the guy need to do and the, the, the constant answer that we got back is you need to lift weights and you need to drill. That was the, the, you know, we, we drilled a lot. And I remember one time I went to wrestling camp when I was in sixth grade with, with my brother Tim. We came back, and uh, he says, well, what would you learn? Well, I learned how to play cards, right, because I was in a, in a cabin with a bunch of older guys. You know, they were playing uh, uh, poker, and, and, and uh, I learned uh, probably a, a lot of things I didn't need to learn. <laughs> right? But I was around these guys, around these great wrestlers and all that stuff. But, you know, I didn't come back with a great knowledge because it was, I saw it, I did it. The next year, we showed up with a notebook. Came, you know, took our notes and all that, came back, and that's what we drilled on. And, 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 and retaining stuff, that's the biggest thing I see, and, and uh, one of the biggest things I see, and, you know, I worked with a, uh, some fourth graders and, and Perry when I was, when my daughter was in fourth grade, so she's 30 now. So, um, and I always talk about having the type of techniques that work on, on, sa on Saturday night. And uh, the parents would get so bored with what I was doing, right, with the, with the repetition and the detail. But, you know, that's what you got to do when you're trying to finish a shot. Just to get a kid to go ahead and not get scored on is a, is, is, is a good deal. And so I think in wrestling we always want to show everybody what we know as coaches, right, not – the, the, the fundamentals that they can go ahead and rely back on because like Gable said it best one time I was on a broadcast with him. He says, the higher level you go, the more it becomes about your fundamentals. And if you don't have those fundamentals down, right, you, 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 you crack and break. And, and, uh, but if you have your fundamentals down, all right, and, and you know, little th simple things like good penetration, good setup, and not getting scored on, and, and you know, uh, uh, you know, then it becomes about, then you can make it more about, less about the wrestling and more about the competing. Mm. Got it. You know what I mean? Yep. In other words, what you, and then where I'm going to, you, you see where the, the those key matches that 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 where some guy breaks or what what happens is because it becomes about the competitor. It becomes less about the wrestling. Mm. I, I really, I really like that because majority of say so just at the state of Iowa, we've got all these little youth clubs out yeah. there, right? And it really kind of puts in perspective as you. I mean, Can I, I, you hear you hear some like co coaches say, "Hey, we're going to show you a lot, and hopefully you pick up like four moves." And you really should focus on those four moves, right? Yeah, but, but once you, once you turn it into being uh, less of a clinic and more about, uh, uh, you see, uh, you know, you see like when John does a, uh, his low single. I mean, he does the con you understand the concepts of it. So when somebody gets really, you know, which low single changed wrestling for thirty years, um, it's missed low single. So. Uh, that becomes a, about, yeah, yeah. You you can show all the variations and all that stuff, but it's really pretty simple. Uh, you know what, what he's lo really looking to try to accomplish, and and you get better at explaining that with age. Uh, but I was talking to Royce one time, and he was telling the story about Gable right before he uh, about to wrestle Andre Metzger <laughs> in the Midlands Finals. And if you've ever been around Royce and Randy Lewis, he's going to bring up Andre Metzger quite a bit because <laughs> Royce beat. Royce beat Andre, and, and, and Randy had a few matches where he didn't. So whatever, it's a, it becomes a uh, one-upper. One-upper. 
right? So, but he, he said Gable came up to him and says, well, nobody's ever won any big matches wrestling. And I think that's what he's talking about. Wow. Yeah. It's just all, it, 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 the big matches are won because they're so, you know, you're, 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 you're locked in there. It's, 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 it, it's the competitive piece of it. And I think that's what, what, uh, what, what for the longest time has separated Gable from, um, you know, you take a look at the way he really coached in the beginning as an assistant coach. I mean, he was, if you just did what he did, if you just became a kind of a, one of his disciples, right, you were going to get better because there's no way, because he, he taught people how to spend more time at it than anybody else. Mm. Those early Iowa teams were spending more time wrestling than, than any other program, right? The volume. And, it's, and, and uh, we had another conversation one time. I, was, I called him up on I-80 one time. And he would, I just said, Coach, I just want to pick your brain for a little bit. And I was, I was in a practice one time, and I was watching these guys, and it was October. And they were doing one-minute goes, all right? Well, one-minute go, blow the whistle. They go out there, shake hands, and on, they get, you know, get it, get it. And all of a sudden, you know, 30 seconds go by. One guy gets on a shot, did a little scramble going on, all that stuff. <laughs> okay. And I go. It's October, right? You get in the room, you roll around, and you go. And you may take two or three breaks or whatever, but you just go, all right? And, and, and I go, it really it just really bothered me because you can build your basic conditioning that way, but you can also just find things out about yourself and also begin to, but a coach to, with a whistle in October, right? Standing over guys doing a uh, deal, and I go, and he goes, he had the, he had the perfect summation of it. He says, "Yeah, I start seeing some of that stuff too." And he goes, "Isn't it amazing that the guys that um, um, once they once they when they're coaching, they do the things that they did when they got there, not the things that did that got them there." And when you become a clinician or whatever, and you want to teach these kids all this stuff, well, what did you know when you when you when you uh, you, you knew a double leg or a double leg or switch to your single leg. My, my college roommate, Perry Hummel, I mean, NCAA finalist his freshman year, we used to give him a hard time because the setup to his double leg was his second double leg. <laughs> boom, 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 got it, you know? So it, it was no setup. He just shot a lot, and he never got spun around, right, against some of the best wrestlers. I mean, do you think coaches do that because their ego comes in play? Or I, I don't know. I, I think that, that a lot of times you can kill these guys with conversation. Overthink it, sometimes. overthink stuff, and, and all that. And I, I'd rather see stuff be approached after practice, or or uh, uh, you know, you got to There's there's one thing about going out there and you know going for an hour and a half, take two or three, four breaks, you know, hour and twenty minutes. That's a good practice. You know, you may make a lot of mistakes and all that stuff, but and I, I and I like the the the, the roll around wrestling that they, they they have a, whatever they call it. Spar, they're not really. Sp- sparring but they're um play wrestling play they call it play wrestling yeah yeah that was we used to call that just rolling so you don't you're, Roll around, you're, you're not a big it. you're not a big believer in the whole thing about like just guys being i mean guys are 26 so wrestling says maybe their bodies are a little bit shot but you still believe in, in the setting the base earlier in the year like you still need a lot of mat time. yeah i think i think you need a lot mat time so i i think it's a it's a sport where you know okay we're going to come in and we're going to do two or three matches or whatever we do that stuff for the last you know I one time I got uh, I pulled my team aside, and it made all the difference in the world. I think in the way I coached, and I said, you know what, we are trying to kill you guys with all the things that we know, right? I said for the rest of the year, and this was in late January, and then we got beat by Oklahoma State. It was down to Oklahoma State wrestling room. I said for the rest of the year, the rest of the season, we're going to work on these four things. And then the rest is going to be you guys wrestling. But the four things we're going to work on is, you know, your go-to shot, right? Down third, you know, you've heard me say this on air probably a hundred times, but but go to your go-to shot, down by, th- by down by one with thirty seconds left. How are you going to ride a guy for a minute? Now, for some guys, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, um, one of the I, you know, I guy that uh, it was. I think it was pretty obvious the guy could make the finals and all that stuff, but hell, he the only reason why, but he could never take the, he wasn't wasn't able to take the guy down. So we we spent a lot of time 
you know, doing what the rules allow you to do is to go ahead and, you know, guy is just barely out on a stand up and you shoot back in and you finish the takedown, right? You do that six times, you got a minute of riding time. You get out in three seconds, all right? So getting out in three, uh, 15 seconds, riding guy for a minute, and great defense on the feet. Head here, head here, head here, head, head, you know, guy shooting in on the leg. And then on top of that, we'd shoot some sort of ace in the hole if you're down big, you know? What's, what's your ace in the hole? What's now, what, yeah. Now, your, your, your co host or, you know, your partner on Big Ten Network, he would say, but Jim, what about Matt returns? <laughs> Well, he's correct, right? <laughs> That's how you continue to ride a guy. So you, you think about, I go, in this, you know, obviously Shane has seen this. He's in it, by the way, right? He makes a cameo. Um, the, um, yeah, it, it's, the mat returns are, are, are a big part of the game. I mean, what, 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 what are you going to do with 20 seconds left? You're just going to let him up and think you're going to take yeah. a good guy down again? No, it's just easier to go ahead and compete with him. But you can't try too hard to get reversed, mm -hmm. right? But it, so I, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer that, that if I was doing, I was in a room today, I would be coaching guys big moves from the bottom position. Side roll, stand up. Don't stand up to get an escape. Stand up to turn and throw. Be Andrew Alvarez where, where he stood up and, Whipped, whipped around, leg lace and go. There was no better time for risk reward to go ahead and do that. You know, I, I, that's why I appreciated that that whole sequence there because it's one of the things I I've been talking about is that one of the easiest ways is to take a guy to a good guy to his back is from when he's trying to ride you, mm -hmm. right? And 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 you've got way too many guys who just want to just get an escape and that's it. Well then. It, you've got to be the best guy on, on the feet. And so I would look for nothing more than my big moves from the, from the bottom position. I, I would try to big move them for 30, 40 seconds. And after a while, you know what they're going to do. They're going to let you up. Yeah, really. They're going to let you up anyway. I, I don't want anything to do with that. Well, that's good. All right. It's going to yeah. give you a quick escape, but be dangerous um, uh, uh, down there. And that's one thing I learned from Russell and Randy Lewis. Holy cow. I mean, after a while, it was like, control everything and, and, and push his hips away. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I was kind of a takedown, let him up guy, all right, on that, because if you tried to ride him, it was going to be trouble. He's going to take you to your back. And, and, guy, and, and guys got in trouble because they clinged onto something and, and off of a single leg or something like that. you got to hit and get out, all right, or, and don't even try to ride him. But, that, but, but that's what I – you know, so some of the things you end up coaching aren't necessarily, you know, your coaching has to evolve and not necessarily be the things that, that you did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's hard to, that's hard to kind of, you, you know, know you, that it worked for you, but it not, might not necessarily work for somebody else. Right. So I think that's well, it, hard as a, it can work for, you know, there, there are, there are basic things that you, that you've got to go ahead and, you know, I, I, I took over the room when it came to getting out of the legs. I really, that, that was such an important part of becoming, a, I found that a lot of guys would become cowards on the feet if they, they gave up a takedown and then um, uh, gave up a takedown and then couldn't get out. Couldn't get out. So they'd stop shooting. Mm -hmm. They stopped getting that, try to get that takedown. Mm -hmm. They'd become defensive wrestlers. And all of a sudden they're in a, well, more three to two matches than you could ever uh, dream to be in in a season. And they weren't progressing. Why? Because they were they they come out of freestyle where you where you try to become like a sheet of plywood, and you don't understand the concept of getting out from underneath is getting back pressure into the guy, and when the guy pressures back into you, you you, you can take that pressure and move. You can do the same thing from your feet, back pressure into the guy. Well, you don't do any back pressure. You see in the internationals, they're starting to switch a lot more. They're hitting the switches, right? And 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 but you know you got to have uh, you know some back pressure but if you back pressure and freestyle too much everybody's going to roll back, <laughs> back over it doesn't, doesn't make any sense but i think that that position has helped uh our guys internationally learn how to compete i i think that we're we're, we're putting guys out there that are long in the tooth but know how to compete mm -hmm. and where did they learn how that where, where did they learn that folks huh? yeah so I mean, I, I love watching freestyle because it's got the best athletes. You know, you watch some of these guys. That, folk style is hard. Folk, folk star is hard. It is. Everyone wants to try to avoid and, the hard. You don't see a, a guy, uh, you don't see many foreign-born wrestlers do very well immediately in, in uh, folk style wrestling. It just, just becomes too hard. So when is the, uh, when's, 
when's the official debut to the public and how, how can they watch the duel? Well, it, you can follow us on the duel.org. All right. We've got these upcoming screenings here. We're excited for next week because we're going to Waterloo uh, on, the, on the 17th. The one on Waukee is going to be the 18th. All right. That, that there's that. That's a, uh, so Tuesday and Wednesday of next week, we'll be doing screenings. Once at the Dan Gable Museum, we're going to do episode three there. Uh, that's going to be uh, great because you're going to have Royce and Bill Tate sit down together. And um, um, it was just an epic match, but it's even better to see these two guys sitting next to each other. The world needs a lot more Bill and Royce. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, on the 18th, we're doing the screening in Waukee. We've got about 18 tickets left for that uh, as of now, as of today. Um, so that, that likely will be sold out. And then we go the 4th to Sioux City uh, up there for a night with Dan Gable. And that's going to be a fundraiser for the museum up there at, at Sioux City and uh, uh, Sioux City Chamber of Commerce. And then uh, November 15th and November 17th, we're going to Iowa City at the Hilton Garden Inn. Uh, it'll be another uh, Episode 5 Gable-centric uh, showing. And then Episode 1 at uh, Ames at Jack Trice Stadium at the, uh, in the uh, Sioux Cup end zone, which will be a lot of fun. I think we can get about four or 500 people in there. And then, and then when can they watch it? When will it be uh, live online? Like for people that can't. That yeah, it, it, we, we hoped we're in the final with the QC quality control of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the different streaming platforms, Amazon, Google uh, Play, Apple Plus, YouTube TV. Uh, I think there's a couple others there that, that we're going to be able to stream on. We hope it's going to be available uh, in mid-November. Uh, It'll be about two ninety nine an episode, which is their lowest uh, 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 price point. And then sometime after that, uh, hopefully before the Iowa, Iowa State duel, the whole episode, the whole uh, the series will be available for nine ninety nine. So, you know, we, we uh, the other thing that needs to be mentioned here is that you can follow us on the duel dot org, like you see on this little. Uh, we go in this direction here. There, there we go. go. The duel dot org. All right. I'm messing up my hat. <laughs> right, it's, not, it's got uh, this this hat I gave. He's got uh, my signature and Gable's signature on it. So uh, make a hell of a YouTube. So I, I gave it to Gable. He signed first, and then I put mine on afterwards. <laughs> 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 so, so and then we also uh, uh, last thing that I'd say is we got those uh, gave you a, a, a poster here. We got this, you know, this uh, the duel. And uh, so my man John has uh, done a great job of doing all these things and on social media. And we're trying to get people to watch this one soul at a time. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, uh, it's been a unique journey here for us, but we've become good friends and closer friends than we actually were to begin with. So if that was possible. But the, um, um, I guess how you follow it here is that the, the one thing I wanted to mention is, is our, our foundation. So we've paid for this. We are uh, set up a foundation, so we get about three or four dollars with every uh, sale of, of that, and we're going to put that those dollars into a foundation. A lot of these guys were very; um, uh, they're still involved with sport, helping out with youth, and, and we set up a, a, a foundation to help promote and and um, um, you know support amateur wrestling in the country. So that could look like a lot of things. It could look like you know, there's a lot that we there's a lot of pretty good media people that we've seen here. Pin Doctors has been really helpful with us to to uh, uh, get um, um, some exposure here. Little collages they they've been doing on that. We're thankful for all that. But uh, you know, there's some entities that we want to help support in this in wrestling. We just don't we just don't know where it'll go. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but hopefully, people find some value in it, and um, we're very proud of it. And like I said, it's like one of these uh, uh, guys that you coach that you all of a sudden got really good feelings about, and go. This guy, this guy has what it takes to do it. I think. I think what we've done here uh, is uh, is noteworthy. I'll, I'll just give you an ex example. You, you, ever, you guys watched the Last Dance, mm -hmm. you know, the, mm -hmm. and he's, and you know that uh, Michael Jordan was sitting there with his laptop, right, and he had a cocktail in it. You can tell we're not on Friday afternoon here. But uh, with you guys, <laughs> I'm just with all these beer cans here. Right? So anyway, One. yeah, there you go. Sponsor, Gable beers sponsor, have been, been sponsor. our sponsor. Yeah, and we're gonna actually they're gonna come out with a, uh, a cardinal and gold, black and gold, and red, white, and blue can for Gable beer. 
And uh, so we've been collaborating with them and uh, on that. And so uh, anyway, one of the things that you've ne you'll never have seen before, John's background is special effects, like, you know, um, so he, he inserts things into uh, uh, you know, this, the screen. And so on the laptop, when you're watching one of us look at it, on the back of the laptop, you'll be the, you can see what we're watching. Got it, yeah. And you've never seen that anywhere. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, we call it Sconey Vision, right? Because uh, we got a guy out in New Jersey named uh, Francione, right, that uh, he, he snuck in and, and helped. We didn't know he was watching this, and, but he thought that was really cool, so we named it after him. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sconey Vision. So the... Uh, uh, so there, there's there's some things that that you'll probably see later on when people after people watch this they'll go hey that was a good idea so wouldn't you want to see what Michael Jordan was watching yeah instead of looking at the back of the laptop well my man John put it on there so we're really we're, we're really proud of the technical part of this and uh, like yeah, I said you guys did it your you guys you it was know, a own type two man operation yeah. to some degree and and I tell you what the first time I watched it I was shaking. I was like, I, I hadn't, you know, I think um, the first episode, I did, it just, John, he, he, he edited it all and wanted me to look at it. But before I watched it, all right, I had to get someplace by myself. And I was, I was, you know, you just, I was yeah, nervous, yeah. you know, this has become such of a big part of what we've been doing for the last three years. So this, this, uh, I don't think I've been more proud of anything I've been able to do in, in, in media. I know I'm not. This is this is it. And and after you've done the four thousand minutes of interviews with these guys, um, there, there's you know it was like you made weight. Let's go, right? <laughs> yeah, we're we're finishing this out. You know. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for, guys. For giving yeah. that and thanks for coming today. Appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Appreciate. It. Yeah, I appreciate you. You know, coming on, telling a little bit of people that don't know the history of that, and you know going to watch these yeah. screenings so you can there's go, so much yeah yeah there's so much i feel like we could have a a, a much longer show going well, we'll into back each in episode you know uh, i think once the once everything airs i'd love to have you come in and 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 have you kind of have like a director's cut type of uh you know why this got well this when you way, see you it know? tony which is which is when you get a chance to see it uh uh you know get a chance to see the first episode coming up here but at our walkie screening but uh You'll have a lot of you know, that, that'll spring a lot of stuff, and maybe we can have a conversation about all that. So perfect, right? Perfect, sounds good. Yeah. Well, check it out the dual.org. Yeah, dual.org. That's what they got their information on. Um, they got the screenings on there. Um, there's lots of different links. The trailer is on there. The trailer is on there right now. So three hundred thousand people have seen our trailer. That's awesome. Yeah. So we will. Um, We'll reconvene, and uh, I mean, all this is going to be all, all the hype up too. Yeah, is all going to go down. Basically, the hyping up the Iowa State duel, you know, that's coming on, you know, yeah, at the I end think. of November. So I'm excited for that hype to be back. Yeah, thanks for your time. You bet. Thanks, Coach. All right, good. Yeah. yeah, appreciate it. So thank you. I kind of got on right. tangent city there, but well, you're passionate about it. That's, yeah. that's, that's a little bit. Good. <laughs> yeah. Let's say I feel like I could we could have gone a a couple more hours, honestly. But. Run with her. No one's ever run with her. Would go break her. Yeah. She, if no one what? No one's ever ran with that, that girl at the front. So if someone ran with her, she started getting anxious. You and your daughter ran with her. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, that was pretty good. I've never told that. You know. I know. I, 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 I remember that a lot. Like, 